everyone and welcome to the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host of this educational and engaging cooking show. Today we're at the Townsend, it's located in Quincy. You're going to learn how to make wild boar with stone ground polenta. You'll see my interview with General Manager Josh and also you'll see what cocktail Palmer of the Townsend paired with Bobby, the chef here, his dish. So let's bring Joe and Bobby over, the chef, to learn how to make wild boar. Hi, my name is Joe Murphy. I am a co-founder and chef co-host of the Chef's Table series. The Chef's Table series is dedicated to supporting homeless U.S. veterans in transition as well as young adults that are homeless in transition. And we are in the process of raising money to send these two segments of our population to a certificate program at a Boston-based culinary school. We're very pleased to be at Townshend Restaurant, which is on Hancock Street, excuse me, in Quincy. And we have a great chef, Chef Bobby Sisson. And <laughs> those are his brothers, cousins, uh, sisters, all clapping. They came yeah. here to support you, right? Yep. No, actually, you do have a great reputation, and everybody I talk to loves the, the food and the okay. restaurant. So uh, what are we going to be making? And before we get to that, I always talk about mise en place. And I should say, this show is dedicated to instruction, to be informative and engaging. So the first thing we talk about is mise en place, which is a French term. It means everything in its place. And no professional kitchen can operate without that, right? Very true. Okay, so. Very prepared. All right, so you're going to demonstrate what first? Uh, this is a stone ground polenta with a wild boar ragu. Great. And so, what are your ingredients for the polenta? Uh, the first thing you need to do is start with a liquid. Uh, it's a four to one ratio. It means you need to have four times the products of wet to dry. Right. Uh, I, a lot of people will do vegetable stock, cream, a combination of the two. Uh, I prefer whole milk. Okay. It lives, it gives you a little bit of a richness in body mm -hmm. that otherwise will not be there. Okay. Uh, so whatever base that you start with, I would suggest about a cup per two people. Okay. Uh, so that would be one quart for every two people wow. liquid. Wow. Um, you want to basically start off by bringing it up to a boil at a very low temperature. Yeah, and this is your whole milk? Yes, this is your whole milk. Okay. Uh, and then once you really start to get going and you're boiling, you can then start to add the polenta. Okay. Um, but it should take somewhere around 25 to 30 minutes for that to happen. Okay. So what other ingredients do you add? Do you add a, a Parmesan, do, Romano? Uh, it, it, it's largely based on preference. Okay. Um, I prefer butter, Parmesan Reggiano, right. and whole milk. And that uh, sounds great. Obviously salt. Right. Now, once this is, comes together, is it, uh, uh, is it like a really thick, like almost like a cream of weed or that you type? Would, you, would ex you should expect it to be a bit more of uh, maybe an oatmeal consistency. Uh, you want it to be a little thicker. Right. Uh, to be able to hold onto the spoon, okay. less of a soup like material, right. more of, um, like I said, oatmeal. Right. Um, so you have to really let all the milk be absorbed or cooked by down. By the polenta, yes. By the polenta. It will okay. absorb before it will cook up. Right. And I'm guessing you probably put a little salt in there. Yeah. A little pepper. Fair enough. Okay, great. All right. I see that... Uh, You've got your milk boiling, and then once you get that together, I want to talk about sure. wild boar, because you generally don't see that on a menu. So this is the yeah, the, it's um specifically uh, in the the backcountry regions of Italy where this is even more often than not. This is uh, almost a farmhouse or a working man's dinner. 
Right. Uh, it is very filling. A little goes a very long way. And you can use a lot of the scrap meat that you would not be selling for a profit or mm -hmm. vegetables and so forth. Um, this is a vegetarian dish. It is a very, it's a meat dish. A lot of people eat it with polenta just by itself. And it's very versatile. Uh, so you should expect to see this more so out in the country in um, blue collar type neighborhoods. Right. So this is a very rustic dish. Yeah. And, and my other question is, the menu that you create, uh, I heard some uh, an interview that Carol did with Joss and was talking about trying to build your menus around what happened here in the 1700s. Yeah, so it's, it's the whole thing that we were talking about when we decided to open this was to have that idea of producing yourself or going towards your close neighbors that are producing a product themselves right? before you start looking at a vast mm -hmm. mass-produced uh, wow. right. product itself. Um, this boar actually is one of the furthest items that we purchase um, outside of a few things that are important, like uh, some of the finest polenta that you can get your hands on mm -hmm. still only comes from Italy. From Italy, right. Um, there's a couple places in North Carolina that I'm aware of. Um, but this itself is, like I said, one of the better parks I've ever seen. Okay. Um, so just a quick question sure. for the home chef. Would you recommend, you know, most supermarkets aren't going to carry this, I'm guessing. You can expect to find it at a butcher shop. Uh, and there are a few in the greater Boston area. Okay. Enough that are close by to drive to. Right. Or an Italian specialty store. Or yeah. I, yeah. would, I would very much assume to sit fine with it. Right. Okay, um, good. Supermarkets, like, maybe not. Yeah. A Whole Foods. Yeah. Possibly. Possibly, right. Yeah. Right. Okay, why don't we get the polenta going, So, and we'll watch, see what you one do. One of the things that is extremely important, especially when you're scalding milk, basically, uh, when it gets to a certain temperature, around 180 degrees, you need to start stirring it constantly, otherwise you will stick to the bottom of the pan. Oh, so Chef actually just gave you a great tip, and as he said, once it gets to a certain point, 180 degrees internal temperature, then it could start sticking and burning to the bottom, correct? Yeah, you will feel it before you smell it. Okay. While you're running the metal whisk along the bottom of the pan, it'll almost feel like you're dragging or... going against the grain of a wood table. Right, okay, good. So, pardon me? Yep. This is the polenta itself. Um, it should look like a flour that hasn't been finished being ground yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you do want to add this somewhat slowly while whisking it in. And you need to have the temperature of the milk at a constant high point while you're whisking. Otherwise, the two will separate and they will take a little bit longer to come together. Mm -hmm. It will also uh, have a greater chance of burning the actual polenta and the bottom of the of the pan. Boy, there were three or four great tips. So, you want this milk, and if I'm not explaining it properly, just sure. please jump in. So, as you're ready to put the polenta in, you do it in a slow stream or not a lot at one. Sure. That avoids clumping, I'm guessing. Yes, uh, it, it will clump only if you have a less amount of liquid than is necessary. Okay. Um, you could dump the whole thing in there and then whisk it a little bit and walk away, and it will not so much clump as it will just separate. Oh. Uh, adding it in slowly allows you to keep the temperature hot enough okay. for each individual piece to have a greater chance of being absorbed, uh, to absorb the milk right. at yeah. the pace that it needs. Oh, these are great tips, Chef. Nobody has done a polenta, and nobody has done a wild boar. So, again, you want to put your polenta into the hot milk slowly. See how it's starting to boil right now? Oh, yeah. And then that'll froth right over, too, yeah. as well. That you want to be very careful of, like right. I just did. Right, <laughs> right. Um, if that happens, pull it away. Right. Act like you've done it before and just wipe it up. Right. <laughs> you know, though, 
even professional chefs can run into a little bit of a, a problem. Uh, we were filming a, a great chef. He was from Italy, and he was using his knife skills. And there's a way that you should hold the knife. You use your knuckles as your guide. Somehow he moved his finger under the blade. In, in a professional kitchen, knives, a sharp, very sharp knife is your best friend. So this is not an unusual thing. And actually, he told me he was going to do this just to give you an example. <laughs> you pulled that off. Great, chef. Huh? Great. Really good. So once you start to really start boiling yeah. with the polenta, right. you want to pull it off right. to avoid what looks like a volcanic eruption. Right. Okay. The, uh, There's another great tip right there. Yeah. The liquid that is being evaporated basically will force the hot air will force itself up over the product, and you want to um, you want to avoid having this fill all over the place. Not only that, but it is extremely hot and it does not feel good. Right. Yeah. This is uh, very interesting. If you're a foodie like me. This is very interesting, and Chef is really giving you some great uh, uh, instruction here. So you notice he's still whisking away. This, so really, this is like heating you up garlic have, and olive oil or oil. Yeah, you really you don't want to. You need to pay attention, right? Uh, for the first few minutes while the plunge is being incorporated, uh, it is very important to keep it moving. Yeah. So that again, we don't separate. Wow. Once you start to see it look like what it should be a finished product, which is again very thick consistency, but still kind of liquidy enough to be able to move around, um, you can then start paying a little less attention and turn the heat down. Right. Your tools will be filthy no matter what you do at all times. Always have a spatula on hand, scrape the rim of the, the pot. Yeah. Why don't you tell them One the, of the type spatula you have, Chef? So, uh, a lot of this is high temperature treated spatula. Yeah. So that you can put this into a pan, walk away for a couple minutes, like a, some, a neighbor or a kid or a family member is in the living room yelling at you. This is not going to burn, destroy your meal. Right. Uh, they're usually rated somewhere in the area of about four to 500 degrees. Right. So and they, they have this dark red handle generally. So. It's really a great tool for cooking because one time years ago, I had one that wasn't heat temperature. Right. Yeah. And when I pulled it out, it was like it vanished. Yeah. And uh, I had to throw away the whole dish. Oh, yeah. Melted rubber does not taste good. No. No. <laughs> uh -oh. So, uh, one thing the chef did, and I want to point this out, if you are using, uh, for instance, making a polenta, even sautéing, all of a sudden, if things look like this with oil, it's starting to really smoke, you don't want the oil to burn, do exactly what the chef did. Just take it off that burner, let it sit for a minute, and come down to temperature. And, and that's a great technique to save a product, basically. Yeah. And, uh, and yourself a lot of hassle cleaning something up. Right, right. So, well, you did that very well. So that's not your first rodeo, was no. it? That's happened before. I've milk over before. Yes. Right, right. So uh, I've, let's talk about the boar for a second. Mm -hmm. This stuff um, is a primarily a U.S. product. And again, I said it came from a long distance. Yeah. Uh, it is out of Texas. Okay. Uh, Texas is one of the largest producers for wild boar mm -hmm. in uh, the entire northern hemisphere, as far as uh, North, North America, I should say. Right. Um, it is done on almost reserves, where these animals are left alone to do their own thing. Um, they are, it's completely an FDA uh, approved okay. product, mm -hmm. process of uh, transportation, butchering and all that. Right. Um, for something like this that you're making into a ragu, you want to use an off cut, like a shoulder or uh, like the blade 
something that takes a very long time to cook and would be a little too tough for you. To just knife yeah. and fork. And you, exactly. So are, are you braising this? It is braised, yes. Okay. Um, Does that... For the for the home chef or cook that doesn't really understand braising, would you explain that technique? You're basically reintroducing a flavored liquid mm -hmm. to the meat. So you're cooking it till it's done. Right. You're then continuing to cook until all of its liquid has leached out. It's basically you're drying it out mm -hmm. by cook overcooking it, and then the liquid itself. Uh, gets reintroduced back uh, through a process that involves salts. Uh, it's one of the factors that helps season the inside of a product. Uh, one of the best things that you ever do anytime you braise, leave it in the liquid for days. Mm -hmm. Two to three days after you're done cooking it, leave it in the fridge. It continues to develop flavor the longer it sits. That's a, that's a great tip. And this is similar. Braising is Similar to making your own home beef stew. Yeah. And generally, you're using these tough pieces of meat, and what happens is it tenderizes yeah. it also. It's almost a preservation method as well. Right. So, you know, if you want to make a wild boar, send your husband on the backyard or out in the woods. You might be able to find one. and But give it two or three days sitting in the, uh, in the braising liquid. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of... The things you should also be looking for is um, making sure you're putting some vegetables, spices, aromatics, like herbs, uh, into the braising liquid. Mm -hmm. The more you put in, the more developed the flavor will be at the end of the process. So when, in your braising liquid, are you put making like a mirepoix with a carrot, yeah. celery, uh, onion? I use a pretty standard recipe. Yeah. Um, I typically will go for chicken stock before anything else. Okay, right. Uh, as my liquid itself. I will sear the meat first after it has been seasoned. Uh, remove the meat from the pan. Mm -hmm. Add mirepoix, which is onions, carrots, celery. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get really technical, use two parts onion to one part equal parts celery, carrot. Carrot, right. That's right. Um, I prefer to cut them into large pieces. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't really cut the vegetables up too small. There could tend to be a bitter, acrid flavor if you're cooking them long enough. Mm. Um, That's a good tip. Yeah. Great. And then now, wild you, boar is typically about a four-hour process. Okay. And how large are those cuts of meat? Uh, they're around four to five pounds each on okay. the shoulder itself. Right. So I've never seen boar in any supermarkets. Uh, so you could get it at a... Uh, you can substitute um, a pig shoulder, a pork shoulder, uh, Boston butt, mm -hmm. bone-in uh, shoulder. Right. Um, if you're having enough trouble. Uh, the only difference between the flavors, the boar will be a little bit more of a... A little earthy? Or... Yeah, a little bit deeper of a flavor as well. Yeah. Um, okay. The pork will kind of take on mm -hmm. the flavors that you're cooking with. Right. The boar will add to. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's a great tip. Now, when you're prepping that shoulder, are you trimming all the fat off it, or are you leaving it on? Part of um, the braising process is involving the fat of the animal to help flavor. Right. Um, yeah. Especially you know, creating a fond, which is a buildup on the bottom of a pan, uh, almost the caramelization mm -hmm. of the vegetables and the meat. Nice. And the fat helps with that a lot. It will create a buffer zone between right. the metal of the pan and the meat of the product Great. that neither will burn. Right. Yeah, and I'll tell you, just listening to that explanation and understanding it from a technical standpoint, the flavor that must come from yeah. that is incredible. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the flavor that you get when you're searing meat comes from the caramelization of the sugars right. in the vegetables and the meats that you're working right. with. Yeah. You're just full of great tips, Chef. I'm glad we're here with you. Now, do you discard the vegetables, or do you, when, once you pull, do you mash them or incorporate you, them? A couple of different schools of thought. If um, I'm at home, that's the first thing I'm snacking on. While right. 
after as soon as I pull it out of the oven and so on and so forth. But um, in this type of setting, uh, they are definitely uh, discarded once the liquid, once I pull the meat out of the liquid, yeah, I'll strain the liquid and get rid of the rest. Okay, great. Might snack on a, one or two pieces. Right. Yeah. And I, I, the same thing. And you know, even while you're talking about this technique of putting your vegetables on the bottom after you sear the meat, I think that's what you were talking yeah. about. And it's a great way to do your turkey as well, because yep. once that turkey is done and that fat renders and those vegetables, you are going to get the most incredible gravy. And also, it helps prevent the, your turkey. You know, sometimes you go to take it out of the pan and you have chunks of meat and skin. Well, with that buffer with the vegetables, it'll help stop that. So that's a great technique. So this is just a little bit of the finished product. Yeah. Uh, cooking blends that can take upwards of an hour. Uh, 45 minutes to an hour and 15, depending on how fast you're cooking it, how high the temperature is. Uh, I said the four to one ratio of liquid to dry. Yeah. Don't be afraid to keep a little bit extra liquid on hand in case you need it. Uh, right. If you're cooking at a high enough temperature, it will dry out before it's done cooking. Right. And how do you determine when it's done? By taste? Yeah, you have to taste. Uh, take a little spoonful here and there as you go, especially not only to check if it's done or not, but seasoning as well. Um, when you no longer get a majority of uh, sharp bite kernels, because mm -hmm. you'll be able to tell the difference in the kernels yeah. and that there are actually individual pieces in there mm -hmm. when it's not close to being done. When it is done, you'll still be able to tell that there is... There's some texture? Yeah, but it will be able to easily be... Okay. You won't have to bite through anything right. anymore. Okay, great. Now, do you, at what point do you add your butter and your cheese? At the very so end? So, this is... What I've got in the pan now are the two finished products of both the Boragu and the polenta. Uh, once you start them, you can either do it once you come to a boil or from cold, either way. Um, with the wild boar ragu, I would do nothing but a little bit of veg stock and butter, mm -hmm. along with checking the salts or right. whatever seasons you choose to use. Right. Uh, with the boar, again, I would go with uh, cream, heavy cream and butter. Mm. Right. And pick it up that way. So let's just talk about your ragu. You, you start it with the chicken stock? Yes. Okay. And then you're adding tomato in there? Or no. no? Um, because a red wine. Um, it will, I turn it into a tomato ragu after the fact. Okay. I leave the tomato out of the braising liquid. Right. So once the meat has been braised, I will um, reduce that braising liquid a bit. Yeah. And kind of create its own uh, sauce. Yeah. Pour that over the meat. Let that hang out for a few minutes, and right. then on the side, I'll, I'll start to make the tomato sauce. Right. I use onion and garlic, mm -hmm. along with uh, fennel seed, black peppercorn, and celery seed. Okay. Uh, it gives it a good depth. Right. Um, I will spin those in a spice grinder or uh, uh, a blender. Mm -hmm. Add that to the onions once they've been sweated out. Hit that with a little bit of white wine. Nice. Just enough to kind of clear the bottom of the pan right, up. Right, right. And then I'll add um, San Marzano tomatoes. Right. Uh, usually about, let's say, three pounds of tomatoes per four pounds of meat. Wow. Um, Very that reduces for close to an hour and a half. Yeah. And then I'll combine the two sauces, bring them to a temperature, and pull it off. So when you open that can of tomatoes, are you separating the whole tomato from the juice? You just blend Everything. them, and then they break down while yeah. they're cooking exactly. and you get a nice sauce. And if there's a few chunks in there, so be it. I, I like that yeah. myself. I love that texture. It just really makes a difference. Okay. So, our polenta is coming along. At least it looks like it. We are close to being done. Okay. This is my favorite part. Oh, super. And you get to eat. Right. You know what I'd like to do is if George or Devin could bring out a plate, you could just show us the yeah, plate. No, of I've got it right here. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, I see. You do it like a casserole. 
Yeah, um, we've got uh, a few different places that we like to play around with. Yeah. Um, but this will show uh, a good idea of what an individual portion size size should be. Excellent. Great. Now, do you put any oil or just the ragu first? Yeah. Uh, I would put that? the polenta down first, and then whenever you, traditionally it's the polenta down, you have the polenta in the plate, and then whatever you have accompanying with would go on top. A right. lot of these uh, farmhouses that you'll see this being eaten in, they might have different preferences. They might not have enough uh, scrap meat for all six people that live there or whatever. Right. So you'll take whatever you've got and make mm -hmm. whatever you can. Um, there might be like an eggplant, uh, a marinated eggplant topping for it. It's the wild boar ragu is more of a topping for the polenta uh -huh. than it is uh, the star of the dish. Right. The polenta is really the vessel of the meal. Mm -hmm. So the polenta in this region takes the place of pasta? Is yeah. that what it is? Um, it's your starch? It's, yeah, it's your starch. Right. Wow. Uh, it's usually more of a inland item as opposed right. to the coast. Now, did you go over and research this uh, through I books? Wish. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. Just knowledge of people that I've worked with. Right. Uh, the internet's a wonderful thing. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was supposed to go over after culinary school for a year, and I got sick, and I couldn't do it. Yeah. So then I, yeah, I lost my mind and bought a 4,000-square-foot bakery, and that was a nightmare. Uh, with the boar ragu, mm -hmm. if it looks like it's a little too thin and the meat's starting to break down a lot, I like to have a little bit more uh, chunkier meat. One thing that you can do to help uh, thicken the sauce, just adding a little bit of butter at the very end, mm -hmm. taking it off the heat. All right. Now, are you using salted butter? In. No, never. Right. Uh, always unsalted. Right. So, in professional cooking, you're not going to find salted butter. And for the home chef, I, I always recommend the show. It's a good idea to have a pound because you could freeze it and just take out what you need and then you can season it. And, you know, in cookbooks, you'll see the symbol TT, which to taste. So, you know, a chef is talking about his technique and method and how he puts it together. If you like something a little bit different, do your own thing. Uh -huh. You know, this, this is culinary arts. It's about you're the artist and don't be afraid. All right, so here we go. I gotta tell you, the ragu smells fantastic. Yeah. Now, this was a very good match. Yeah, right, yeah. So uh, again, if you can't find wild boar and if you're a little hesitant to try wild boar, at home, you can I use. Be. Right. You'll be fine, I promise. Okay, good. But the option is if they can't find uh, it. Bone in Boston butt would usually be what I would go with instead. Okay, plenty and then of again, flavor. It's still or... the same thing, it's a shoulder cut yeah. from a pig. Okay, excellent. Well, now you've already put the cheese into the polenta. No, that is the last thing that you would do before you start plating. Okay. So uh, I would use a microplane, uh, it'll allow the cheese to have small enough strands to fold in easily and not have any little chunks and yeah good really affect the flavor too much so you can see that this is really a, a scratch kitchen here they're not buying it all grated or shredded and they're doing a lot of extra work and that's probably why your reputation uh, goes before you Now, I always talk about salt. You're using kosher or sea salt? Kosher. And I always recommend that as well for the home chef. The kernels or crystals, I should say, are larger than your table salt. You're going to wind up using uh, less because the pr flavor profile, I feel, is three, four times better than your table salt. And as a result, because you're using less, there's less sodium intake. Yeah. So that's enough if you're concerned about sodium. But, you know, when you get into these really rich dishes, it's not like you're eating them every day. Yeah, that's true. Unless you're uh, the chef and you're making it every day, right? This is one of the ones that I snack on more regularly than not. Really? Um, but it's, 
it's designed for a very cold, kind of fall, wintry night. Like rib sticking really settles you. Right. Lets you go home. Right. So if we're not satisfied as far as quantity today after the show, what time do you want us to stop by the house? <laughs> Give me till at least 11 in the morning to sleep in. Oh, and then anytime okay, that's fine. Great. All right. All right, Chef, if you want to plate this up, sure. we'll get, uh, we'll finish the show. And just because of time constraints, I just want to mention to you, the home viewer, if you have a, a, a relative, a close friend, whether they're on active duty or they've served our country, give them a hug and a thank you. Uh, today, before the show, I went over to Starbucks and there was a young woman and a young guy and they were both in uniform, and they were in the long line over there, and I said, thank you for your service. And I think, really, you know, we've seen the commercials on TV, so please remember our servicemen and women. Oh, I love what you're doing. And there's the dish. Wow, that is a six-tier list. Well, we want to thank you for watching the Chef's Table series. We want to thank Josh and Devin, the owners uh, of Thompson Restaurant on Hancock Street in Quincy. We certainly want to thank you, Chef, for a great uh, teaching television show. You had a lot of great tips. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to eating this. So until we see you next time, thank you for watching. and welcome to the cocktail segment of the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor. I am here with bar manager Palmer of the Townsend restaurant located in Quincy. So usually we do a wine pairing, a craft beer pairing, but we're changing it up, like I changed up my hairdo, okay? So Palmer's gonna make us a drink that everyone is raving about that comes to this restaurant. So Tell us what you're going to make, because I can't wait to drink it. So I'm going to be making our one true house cocktail, yep. the Adam's Rain. We've had it since day one. Uh, very simple drink. Uh, definitely a drink that gives a nod to where we are, the history of the town. Mm -hmm. uh, but also a drink that no one's ever going to be upset with if oh, they really? wind up with one in front of them. It's delicious. Right. Uh, so starting off with a little bit of fresh lemon juice. And you squeeze your own lemon juice. Absolutely. That's what Josh was saying. Every single day, if not twice a day. Wow. Make it good. Mmm, with freshness. And then uh, we also make a cucumber syrup, uh, puree cucumbers, and then incorporate a little bit of uh, tarragon as well. Ooh, kick give to it. Give it a little extra depth of flavor, uh, and it really does give it a bright, radiant green color. It's beautiful. That is fresh. It's like the Wizard of Oz. And then, last but certainly not least, a lot of vodka. Oh. Oh. <laughs> now, did you come up with this cocktail? Yeah, this was, um, I mean, I believe that every good establishment uh, that's operating as a cocktail bar yep. should have one, at least one true house cocktail. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we wanted to, as much as we love old fashions, Manhattan, <laughs> Gimlets, all the classics, <laughs> we want something to let people know what we were all about. Exactly. That was our own. Mm -hmm. Are you good if I start shaking this up? Yes, you can shake it. Be careful. Yeah, you want to get on the beige dress so look like the green monster or something. Yeah, Terry Brand loves this drink. You still want to win and love this drink. Except for children. Yeah, no kids. Okay. All right. We shook that up with actually some cold draft ice, oh. which we're lucky enough to have here at the Townsend. Uh, you can see one big, clear, pure hunk of ice. What's the difference? Um, coldness. Oh. Good cocktail should be cold, cold, cold. Oh. So the dry ice is colder. Good to know. 
Now, do you do this whole pouring thing in front of the people? They must love it, right? Oh, absolutely. It's like the drama of the cocktail. And that little 10 second delay <laughs> builds up a little anticipation. Right. Oh. So pretty right. with the, um, in the glasses, too. Then we finish it off with a little slice of dried lemon. Oh. Very creative. And away we go. Thank you, Palmer. You're so welcome. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, here comes the taste. Ooh, very good. Nice and cold and tasty. Yeah. I could probably have one more and I'm good. <laughs> I will be dizzy from the. Oh, very good. I won't huh? tell you how many Carrie can have. <laughs> Just got that now. Palmer, thank you. Of course, please. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. So everyone, this has been the cocktail segment of the Chef's Table series. I'm here at the Townsend Restaurant in Quincy with my new friend. So I'm going to come visit you and drink yes. this with you. The bar manager, Palmer. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Farm to Table Tip on the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor and I am here with the host of the Farm to Table Tip, Steve Farrell of Vero Farm. So Steve, it's boiling outside with the heat, <laughs> but we are here in the walk-in cooler and I see a lot of produce and this is where you keep the, um, right. the produce in this hot weather. <laughs> You never know it was hot outside today, but this is the hottest day of the year. It is, yep. And we're in a cooler we just built last year. It's a oh, new one. Yep. And has a couple of features. We have this curtain hanging in the middle so we can uh, we can maintain two different temperatures. It goes a long way down there. Oh. And uh, we can also regulate the humidity. So in the Cold, what we call the cold section, where we keep the lettuce and greens and things. Mm -hmm. We can keep it right down around 35 degrees and about 95 or 99 percent humidity. Wow! Then in this, That's amazing. we call a warmer section. We run more like 45 degrees, and we'll keep the uh, summer squash and eggplant and peppers and beans Ooh. and some of the things that don't like to be quite so chilly in here. Right. <laughs> and right, right now we're set up. Uh, for tomorrow's CSA, mm -hmm. uh, all of these items here will be uh, for CSA pickup tomorrow. Oh, kale and scallions yeah, yeah, and the, uh, romaine. The Swiss chard. Oh, Swiss chard, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Chinese cabbage. Oh. Chinese cabbage. Wow, that looks beautiful. Scallion. Oh. Excellent. They're very popular. I'm surprised how many people go for scallions every week. Yeah. And a little more chard. Uh, Chard's the season. Spinach. Oh, those are big leaves. Goose squash. Oh, more greens down there. Some of the things we just picked today are still outside. Yeah. And I'll get, we have some beautiful carrots right here. Oh. They look like Bugs Bunny <laughs> carrots. I'll come out of here. Oh. There'll be a lot of nice peach and carrots. Uh, oh my God, those are beautiful. Tomorrow. Yeah. Bugs Bunny. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and lettuce and mm -hmm. uh, oh, kohlrabi. What's oh. that? <laughs> you never had kohlrabi? I don't think so. We'll have to do a session on that. We're going to have to do a tip on that. Yeah. As Carol enjoys and eats. <laughs> Whatever it's called, karate. <laughs> no, that's good. Raw or cooked uh, oh, really? leaves you can use to evolve the whole thing. We'll have to have, we'll have to cook it together. Right. Okay. And we eat it either yeah. cooked or raw. That'd be great. <laughs> so, Steve, thanks for um, showing us your um, walk in cooler. Yeah. It's very cool in here, everyone. So, thanks, Steve. So, everyone, this has been the Found a Table Tip at Barrow Farm. I'm Carol O'Connor with Steve Barrow. So we'll see you next week. Hello everyone and welcome to the interview segment of the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host, 
And today I'm at the Townsend Restaurant located in Quincy. And with me is General Manager Josh. So Josh, thank you so much for being on the interview segment with me. Not a problem. Thanks for coming so in. So tell me now, I'm going back into history class, and I remember the Townsend Acts that Great Britain imposed on the colonials, the tax on paint, lead. Is that how come the restaurant is called this? Yes. Yeah. We uh, While we were looking through, we stopped at a couple of uh, places around town, and uh, the Townsend acts kind of popped into our head and it really once we found out what it what it was and how it yeah. had affected the then colonists we kind of translated into what we do as a business where hmm. um, like you said they got they got taxed on everything yeah. so in turn instead of kind of taking it they started making everything themselves so um, we translate that all the way through, through from the construction of the space to the bar program into the kitchen as well Wow. So we make our own sauces. We're squeezing juice every day, um, down to the the build out where we, you know, built the tables and mm -hmm. and put this together. Oh no way! Even so, the tables? Yeah. Wow. And um, tell me more about the restaurant. Tell me about like the decor. We're going to be filming that and everything. We wanted to do something that had that casual feel. Mm -hmm. So when you walk around and you'll see the you know the butcher block tables, but we wanted a little more chicness to it. Um, yeah. The fun part about building a restaurant is that you have the idea in your head, but the end result kind of comes out differently. So then you you work the space from there. Right. So it almost builds itself at that point. Right. And I find that a lot of restaurants are doing the butcher block look or the um, bartender because it's communal. Yes. It's to bring people together, whether they're strangers or not, and to um, eat and drink here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was the the general idea was when we when we were talking about opening this place is to have some place where people can come and have a dinner with mm -hmm. the family or after work drink. Exactly. So um, now tell me about the menu here. Uh, we kind of <laughs> leave that up to the chef. Mm -hmm. You know, there we have our points. We have our you know ideas of what we'd like to see, but. Um, with his style of cooking where it's a little more rustic. He likes the oh, ingredients to speak okay. to themselves and not overwhelm each other. Right. So we do a little more rustic, but we, we, we polish it up a bit. Mm -hmm. So you describe it as like seasonal, the ingredients, like you're always changing the menu. Very and... seasonal. We change the menu probably about four or five times a mm -hmm. year, all the way through from the kitchen, the bar menu, everything. Right. Now tell me about your bar program. That was kind of, when you said that, it kind of stood out for me because no one I've interviewed has ever said that. So I'll explain that. The, the idea that we've learned over the, the course of our careers right. is um, the focus has always been on the kitchen and, mm -hmm. and you right. know, and that um, with the recent emergence of the, the modern day cocktail or, co you know, classic cocktails mm -hmm. coming back, um, the extra care that a chef would take while, you know, selecting ingredients, that gets transposed into the, the bar program mm -hmm. um, where we look for, again, like you said, seasonal items, what's you know, you're, what you're going to have, what right. you're going to drink during the summer is suppose what you're going to drink. Totally, drink something during totally the different, right? So that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I really like it. Um, so Kerry Byrne, we yeah. all know him. He loves this place. So <laughs> we were so excited that we were able to work with you and your team to have the cooking show here. Well, we're glad you guys came down. So I really appreciate it. Anytime. Thanks, Josh. Cheers. So everyone, this has been the interview segment of the Chef's Table series here in Quincy, historical Quincy. Um, at the Townsend Restaurant. So we'll see you next time. And welcome to the historical segment of the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol O'Connor, co-host, and we're exploring Quincy. And with me is my friend, Kerry Byrne. He was born and raised in Quincy and has a passion for history. So, Kerry, where are we now? Well, right now we're in, in the basement of the Church of the Presidents, a holy shrine of American history. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because of what we're about to see, Carol, the yes. Adam's Crypt. The Crypt. The, the Adam's Crypt, the only place in the world where you can see the tombs of two presidents, not only two presidents, but two first ladies, and they're entombed right here amid Quincy Granite in this oh. uh, pretty powerful little, little spot. So, you wanna head in? Yeah, let's head in. Oh, it's got the gate and everything. Okay. 
So Carol, mm-hmm. what we're looking at are the tombs of John Adams, mm-hmm. Abigail Adams. John Adams is obviously the second president of the United States, first vice president. Abigail Adams, his wife, the great patriot and feminist and first lady. Their son, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, and his wife, Louisa Catherine Adams, who was the darling of Washington during her time as first lady, was an American born in London. The Adams actually came from fairly humble means. Yes. Uh, John Quincy, living uh, uh, kind of a much more opulent lifestyle because of the success of his parents mm-hmm. uh, in later life, and uh, met the socialite Louisa Catherine in, in London. And uh, but this is a pretty amazing place. This it is, is. It's almost haunting. Yeah. It is haunting when you come down here and understand what what who is buried here. The, the body of John Abigail and John Quincy and Louise Catherine are actually in here. Uh, John Adams, not only the second president, that doesn't do him justice, he's probably the greatest political mind in yeah. the history of man. Because this is the man who created constitutional government as we know it today. Mm-hmm. He wrote the Massachusetts Constitution here in Quincy in 1779. The Massachusetts Constitution is the oldest governing document in the world. It's still in power today. He penned it by himself here in Quincy. It was adopted in 1780. While the war still raged for three more years, Massachusetts had already adopted an independent government three years before the end of the war. Uh, In the U.S. Constitution, with its separation of powers, its three branches of government, uh, all came from the Massachusetts Constitution that, again, John Adams wrote. So every human being in the world today grows up under a constitutional government, or if they don't, they aspire to do so. It's the, it's the known standard for how a, a society should yeah. be governed, right? right? This man created it, mm-hmm. at least the version that we know of it today. Mm-hmm. Again, probably the most important political mind in human history. Abigail Adams, who helped keep this country together during the tempest sure. of civil commotion mm-hmm. of the revolution, as they called it. Uh, she's just an incredible woman. Their, their, their uh, prolific writings together are a great source of uh, history today. She tells us a lot about what happened during the revolution. I mean, she melted down her own pots and pans to make bullets to fight the revolution. I mean, wow. she was at the forefront. She was active. Right? As she was active in, in, the, in the revolution, mm-hmm. very active. Uh, and of course, the, the revolution and, and John's sub, subsequent uh, official service to the nation kept him apart for great stetch, stretches. Sure. He traveled all over the world, you know, to France, to England, uh, you know, as an ambassador, as an emissary, of course, to Philadelphia for the Constitutional Congress, for both Constitutional Congresses, as president. They were apart for much of their life, but maintained an incredible bond that, in many ways, kept this country together. Mm-hmm. Their son, John Quincy, is a uh, as many know, was widely considered the smartest of all the presidents. He was a, a, actually considered a genius, a brilliant, brilliant man. Served to the court of Russia in St. Petersburg as a 13-year-old boy. <laughs> he was a secretary wow. to the ambassador because he, was, he spoke French, and French being the official language of diplomacy. And at that age, he, he, and how he got to France the first time is at the start of the revolution, John Adams was sent to Paris to represent the fledgling underground you know, continental uh, government and brought his son, who was just a boy at the time, seven or eight years old, John Quincy with him wow. across the ocean to, to, you know, to, to, to Europe. They landed mm-hmm. far from where they were intended. They had to cross the Pyrenees Mountains and get to Paris. I mean, they really had an incredible adventure. And John Quincy ended up becoming the most well-traveled, well-educated, uh, well-read American of his era, mm-hmm. truly a brilliant man. And both of them you know, served greatly to this country. John Quincy Adams was unusual among presidents. After being president, he served back in the House of Representatives. He was a, a practicing attorney. He, he argued before the Supreme Court. Again, oh, after right. being president, mm-hmm. most notably defending the, the, the slaves aboard the Amistad slave ship, uh, made, made famously right, into a movie, movie called Amistad. Mm-hmm. Uh, truly brilliant man. And, and all four of these people, John and Abigail Adams and John Quincy and Louisa Catherine Adams, dedicated their lives to the service of this country. And without them, specifically without John and Abigail, yeah. this country probably would not exist as we know it today. Right. Incredible piece of history right Definitely. there. Definitely. And um, we're going to see the flags. But the flags have a, a, diff- a little bit different. Yeah, flags. well, if you notice here, there mm-hmm. are 15 stars on this flag because there were 15 states when John Adams was president. Yeah. So, the, the, and, But unusual about this flag, there are also, fi- also 15 stripes. Mm-hmm. So for a while, people said, hey, let's add a stripe and a star. And it became pretty apparent after a while that you couldn't right. keep adding stripes. Right. So they went back to the original 13 stripes to represent the original 13 mm-hmm. colonies and add only stars. So in John Quincy's uh, tomb over there, there are 24 stars 
because there were 24 states when he was president, but back to 13 right. uh, stripes. So that's great. Uh, they kept the flags. Yeah, right? yeah, and uh, all this time. And every year on their birthdays, yeah. oh, October 30th uh, for John Adams and yeah. July 11th for John Quincy. The president. This happens for every president in, yeah. the, in, the, in the in every former president. But the sitting president of the United States yeah. sends a gift. Uh, of flowers and, a, and they have a ceremony with an official representative of the President of the United States uh, to basically wish happy birthday to the former presidents. Wow. That happens twice each year here in this building in the Church of the Presidents. Right. Uh, literally steps from the MBTA red line across the street. But uh, on October 30th there will be a ceremony here to say happy birthday to John Adams and uh, on July 11th we'll do the same for John Quincy with many local dignitaries and quite a powerful and patriotic ce be. ceremony. Wow, I never knew they did that. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. and do it twice, twice in this building every year. Carrie, you're just so full of knowledge. I can't wait to explore more parts. <laughs> we got a lot. Excited. We got a lot more to see. Awesome. A lot more to see. So everyone, this has been the historical segment of the Chef's Table series, exploring Quincy with Carrie Byrne, and we'll see you next time.